That's why I would say a minimum of, of efficiency gain is north of 30% that you see by, by just implementing these tools. That's, that's huge. I mean, especially it's huge when you know that a drug in its in development is 2 billion. And if you take 30% out of 2 billion, and if you take 30% of more than, than, 12, than 12 to 14 years at this stage, then it's really reaching all these dimensions where at the end it will have true impact yeah. on, on costs for patients. Hey, Philip here. Welcome to the second episode of the Flood Bio Show, where I interview the best Europeans in biotech to help you be inspired and grow. Today I'm in sunny but also a bit windy Hamburg at the uh, headquarters of Evotech uh, to meet with, with Werner, with the, the big boss. I've known Werner for, for many years, almost a decade, and we have been on stage a few times. Um, and he's really a brilliant speaker, and not only because he's really sharp, but also because he's really you know, friendly, accessible. You, you just want to talk and listen to him. For a bit of background, Werner is, uh, has actually a degree in psychology and, and business and has no bio background, which is pretty rare in, in the industry. He was then CFO of Intercell, which is one of the biggest success stories in, in Austria for, for almost 10 years. Uh, and after that, so almost 15 years ago, he became CEO of, of Evotech. And the company went into fast growth with him, uh, went from 500 employees to almost 5,000, from 50 million euro revenues annual to now 750, uh, and has today a market cap of between 3 and, and 6 million euros. Uh, and today Evotech is a, of a mix between a, a CIO and a um, drug development company. So the CIO side, as, as Werner told me, was we can do any experiment under the sun. Uh, and on the drug development side, they, they co-own and co-develop uh, close to 200 assets. That's it for now. Let's head inside to the, let's head into the building, meet with Werner and discuss many things from AI and biotech to his mind to many, many things and exciting things. So let's go. So Vena, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thanks for welcoming us. A wonderful Hamburg, some sun even. Oh, I made the sunshine for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great to talk with you offline, online. I mean, uh, always amazing discussions uh, today. We see a lot of things we could cover. Um, but I want to start not with the IT attack that we just had a quick talk about, but I don't think it's the most fun topic, not the most interesting. But the, I think one that we can start off is um, AI in biotech. And if you remember last time we talked in, in Vienna, actually, by Europe, I watched the video and we talked already quite a lot about AI in biotech. Um, and that was 2019. And I, I will link to the, to the video. And what's, what's amazing is that you slash Evotech have been in advance on that topic quite a lot, especially in the biotech industry, it tends to lag quite a lot into IT and, and software. But obviously now, I mean, ChatGPT, DeepMind, AlphaFold, I mean, in the last six months, it's crazy what happened. So I was just wondering, like, if you can dig into it, let's say from 2019 to now and how you integrated, let's say, the last the last big developments. Yeah. So first of all, thank you for recognizing us as a true leader when it comes to AI and machine learning in our industry. Why do I say this? Because we have always understood AI and machine learning as an integrated part of a new normal when it comes to drug discovery and drug development. Because a tool in itself has no value. Mm. But a tool, when it makes outputs better, has enormous value. And that's why we have decided already in 2017, 18, when we saw the first uh, processes arriving mm -hmm. out of machine learning and AI, that it has to be an integrated part of our drug discovery and drug development thinking and not an isolated mm -hmm. software-driven <laughs> offering. 
And today I would say that every process is driven more than ever before by cost pressure and efficiency to come to drugs faster and with this more cost efficient. Mm. And that's what AI and machine learning effectively does, that you can accelerate an experimental cascade to a wet lab experiment mm. with the AI and machine learning tools yeah, significantly faster. And that's, again, where I'm coming to the integrated approach of this because isolated doesn't make sense. And the significantly, how much are we talking about? Because, I mean, is it, you know, 10%, 30%, 50%, 200%? No. Depends on which approach, I guess, but like... If it, it really covers three dimensions. It covers quality of the experiments mm -hmm. that you're doing. It covers costs and it covers timelines. But it's important that it covers all three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And if you take it, and this would only be a marginal help, it wouldn't help anyone. Mm -hmm. But I'm so convinced about this because it's a substantial mm -hmm. help to make drugs more precise and faster. And that's why I think some of the experiments are only possible now. So it's not a question of make something 5% or 10 or 20% yeah. better. It's only possible, possible yeah. because we can accelerate and analyze so much more data. Mm. And the other thing is it will have a huge acceleration aspect when it comes to, for example, prioritizing experiments. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that's why I would say a minimum of, of efficiency gain is north of 30% that okay. you see by, by just implementing these tools. That's that's huge. I mean, especially it's huge when you know that a drug in its in development is two billion, and if you take thirty percent out of two billion, and okay. if you take thirty percent of more than than twelve, than twelve to fourteen years at this stage, then it's really reaching all these dimensions where at the end it will have true impact yeah. on on costs for patients. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about this integrated aspect as well i mean mm. so if i summarize instead of saying okay it's like you have the software division or like one you know the software silo the software is actually um, horizontal and spread across every different divisions um but and then what i would be curious about this is how you do the development slash the integration of tools because mm. i guess you don't do all the ai machine learning models necessarily yourself. There's probably some blocks that you take into. Can you go a bit over there? And I mean, and there is a huge complexity there as well. And it's a different job. I mean, probably open AI, it's crazy number of, of engineers as well. So can you just go there, like how you, how you do the development, how you integrate it, how, yeah, all these aspects, uh, I'm curious. I mean, very often we think that in biotech we have to reinvent every process where the tech industry has already been sometimes three to five years ago. Yeah. And if you look today at the AI machine learning tools that tech companies have integrated into their search engines, into their optimization um, algorithms, then you can imagine that we don't have to reinvent everything. Mm -hmm. We can really accelerate our learning by learning here from many of the tech industries. Having said that, our world is significantly more complex because biology is a totally different dimension of complexity yeah, yeah. and optimizing chemistry is a totally different dimension of complexity. But message number one is we don't have to reinvent all of this. We can learn what the integration means from others. Mm. Message number two is when you are building experimental cascades, it's always a very rigorous standardized process that you go from a target that you have identified to optimize a target. Mm -hmm. And in optimization of a target, if you can do this with an integrated algorithm and you can prioritize, for example, 10 targets in 10 dimensions via an algorithm, all of a sudden a lot of manual work falls completely away because you just will not work on the ninth priority. Yeah. You will yeah. only work on the top three priorities. And that's, I think, how you should imagine how, how, this, how this works. And it's really 
optimizing these bottleneck processes that were up to now significantly higher manually done than we'd, what we will do in the future. Yeah, that's interesting. And you were, you were talking already 2019 mm -hmm. that it's not about replacing Evotech scientists or Evotech staff, it's about augmenting them and allowing them to do many more experiments. How did that change between 2019 and, and now? I mean, in total, in 2019, we were probably 3,600, 2,700 scientists in the company. Now we are close to 5,000 yeah. scientists in the company. And despite that there is a, a tough funding environment for biotech, we are recruiting this year quite heavily. And it's especially these processes that, it, that we are augmenting, mm. where we see, for example, in a, in a, in a massive effort when it comes to data Uh, aggregation and data analysis, bringing here a platform together is just doesn't exist on the planet. Mm. And that's why, for example, a tool that we have developed called Pan Hunter uh, will be super important for the whole industry once we have fully rolled it out, because then people can just understand way, way, way faster where does their molecule sit in the whole universe of data analysis that they can access. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned the growth of, of EOTech employees. It's still, we, we could touch that a bit later. It's crazy how, mm. how fast you have, you have grown and, and consistently and fast. Maybe to stay mm. a bit more on this topic. On the, I'm curious if you, if you zoom out a bit. I mean, EOTech, obviously, you have it integrated. I'm curious like how, it, how your stack or how your AML capacity compare to, let's say, others in the industry. I'm thinking about some like you kind know, of AI biotech integrated companies. I mean, Accenture comes to my mind, but you have invested there, so probably, you know you know pretty well what's going on. And or there's some, probably some complementarity. Or I'm thinking about Moderna, who have also their own stack and super automated. I mean, pretty crazy. Even like three, four years ago, where they like everything super automated with in-house software. I was I mean, really amazed when I when I mm. saw that four, four years ago. I'm curious, like, in your view, how, how basically, yeah, how do you if, you, if you take a bit of zoom out approach, how, how, what, what's the picture, basically? Um, First of all, it's only natural that many companies are taking the approach to understand AI and machine learning and implement their uh, understanding into their processes. Yeah. Every company will do this. Uh -huh. Every company. So I think it's not, uh, is Moderna doing this or, or not? Every company at the end <laughs> will have to do this because Let's otherwise... Say, who, you who is doing it well then? <laughs> yeah, but I think also here people will learn from the best mm. and then it comes down to where do you achieve the best synergies? And as you mentioned, for example, Exciencia, we are partners with Exciencia, okay. where we really have synergies in drug discovery projects where something that has to be done is way better in their hands than in our hands. But if you put it together, it makes what we always call the shared R&D paradigm really work. Mm. When it comes to AI and machine learning, one of the important uh, aspects is, and that applies to many, many of the disease areas as well, The starting point is understanding molecular data. The starting point is who can, can analyze molecular data fast and precise enough to make this a starting point to feed the algorithms. Mm -hmm. yeah? So that's why we are not that much focused on optimizing the algorithm only. We are focused on how good and how well organized and how... how fast can we access biology-driven data into these algorithms. And that's where molecular patient databases mm. are for us super important, and they will be super important for the whole industry because that's where you want to start a drug discovery mm. campaign at a human molecular patient data point mm. and not at some random, I don't know, animal data point or, or, or just an, an unproven uh, target that you find somewhere. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, yeah. At the, I mean, at the end, these models need like huge amounts of data. I mean, so data probably are already available. And mm -hmm. then I think you mentioned also that some data when you need to generate them. 
I mean, a chat GPT is, is amazing because you can you can do your loops like in vitro, like basically running them, and then the model improves yeah. very quickly. But once you add, I guess, a wet lab experiment in there, then your loop is just so much slower. Exactly. Um, but can you expand a bit there, like? Yeah, how how do you optimize this looping? I guess there's also some automation needed, so then the loop is accelerated. It's actually, a bit. at the end, it's much more trivial than it sounds. Um, yeah. Because once you have built, and let's go to a simple example, once you have built, let's say, an AI-enabled prediction of safety data on a specific organ, mm. yeah, where you say, let's take... Dili as a as a readout for um, for kidney diseases. Uh, you want to see Dili talks as fast as possible, and you want to predict certain targets mm. on their Dili talks profile. Every time you can add one target or one molecule, where you can say this has Dili properties. Mm. Of course, your whole system is learning, yeah, yeah? Okay. and and that's why. A little piece of information that is wet lab proven or that is human proven, yeah, that goes back into the system makes the prediction quality significantly better. And that's why I'm always coming back to this sharing principle of our industry because it does not make sense if only one company is optimizing targets for Dili talks. Mm -hmm. But if you are having these capabilities to predict something like that, and then you are sharing this amongst the industry, then it becomes really powerful because then really the whole process for the whole industry gets more efficient and every individual also gains by knowing that the platform that they are using is better and better and better. Yeah, but then, yeah, let's, and that's super beneficial for Ivotek, I guess, as a... No, platforms that's, that's here. Petition, that, no, that's n and that's that's my point. It's beneficial Fiber. for the industry, yeah. Because if you can exclude safety liabilities, yeah. let's say a year earlier, that typically means five million earlier in in the early drug discovery and drug development process. It augments your opportunity costs, yeah, by five, five million where you are depriving this experiment and you go to the next experiment. So that's where really everyone wins. Yeah, but still, if you are, I um, mean, still if Evotech is a company who has, I mean, who has a toxicity prediction platform, you will still capture some part of the value as well, even though on the total, everyone will win. This is a for-profit business and we are not <laughs> naive, so let's not go there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, no, it it, it 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 makes me also think about, makes me connect to let's say quite some farmers outsourcing their R&D slash mm. even selling part of their R&D in Evotech you've bought, at least the, the site in Toulouse. I think you from Sanofi you bought recently. I forgot which big farmer last month. No, from from Galapagos in Paris. I think that, that was not us. Not you. No. Oops. Uh, <laughs> I guess you were on the deal, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Uh, that's not, but anyway, you, you bought quite a few like R and D capabilities slash zero capabilities from from pharma, yeah. and then you in essence uh, are like you, you you do it in house. Um, yeah. How? What? Can you like expand a bit there? On let's let's step back here two seconds. Yeah. What? I always thought is the most inefficient way of trying to, to do what we all want to do in this industry. We want to solve diseases. Yeah. Yeah? And we want to make medicines that matter for patients. If you have a disease which is enormously large, let's take Alzheimer, yeah. Yeah? and everyone tries to create a silo to solve that problem, it is per se inefficient. Yeah. And again, this is not naivety here where I say, let's share everything. I'm totally um, fine with being competitive and the fastest should win and innovation premium should go to the fastest and the best in the industry. Mm. But what we all should share is information 
that is helpful to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, if you think back to the R&D centers of pharma in the past, by the way, they now are so much better than they were mm. 15 to 20 years ago. Now they are really high, high, high performance organizations. But if you think back, yeah, you had an R&D center, which was a cost center, and which was only productive to feed one pipeline of one company. That there's a match of the capacity that you have yeah, and the capabilities yeah. that you have with what your pipeline need is, is, is a very much. rare instance and it's very hard to keep it up. And all that Evotech has been doing in the past is to say, okay, why don't we create internal cost centers and make them profit centers that are not only there for one company, but that are there for many companies. Yeah? Mm. And if you follow that principle, then all of a sudden an internal R&D center from former GSK in Verona, yeah. which has enormous capacities and capabilities, and if you open that to many players, becomes not a cost center that is, quote-unquote, seen as how can we ever make this productive. It becomes a very productive profit center for many companies. Mm. And that's why we are just, as a collective industry, starting to learn these principles of the shared economy. And that's why we are just at the beginning of what we are doing. It's inter yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and it's, it's one of the rare I mean, yeah. examples. Patients will win. Biotech companies who work with us will win. Pharma companies who work with us will win and foundations who work with us and academic institutions who work with us will win. Everyone will win, yeah. I'm still thinking, uh, playing the devils on what, who, who will, or who, who is losing what. Yeah, you're the nicest devil I've seen so far. <laughs> but, 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 uh, and if the devil looks like you, then welcome to hell. <laughs> um, then we should all go probably there. No, but I I again, it's, it's also something where you should never underestimate how big the non-satisfied market opportunity is. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are, I would totally agree with you. If this would be a limited world where market opportunity is very small, then, of course, you have many downsides because then this ends in typical collusions, this ends in yeah. price competitions, this ends in yes, many, many stupid things that markets do. Mm. All understood. Yeah, I even studied this <laughs> in my past. But if you're talking about wide open, underserved markets, then we all have all reason to go there, especially when you know that 3,300 diseases are currently it's not treatable not certain, or yeah. only under very, very uh, symptomatic versions treatable. Yeah? Mm. So that's, that's really where I think the difference in our industry is, and that's why this whole sharing economy is just at the beginning. Mm. That's interesting. I, I'm still thinking about some parallels in some, I mean, if you take probably the car industry is very, very kind of very open with a lot of providers and integration, but then some players, let's say Tesla, are very integrated and have also very good at like... Yeah, the car industry is very complex and, and I never really understood it because <laughs> I don't like it so much, but there are other industries which are much simpler. Yeah? Yeah. Um, think about the oil drilling industry. Yeah. No one, no one yeah, today is stupid enough to say I drill a hole into the ocean alone anymore. Yeah. Mm. Everyone has established a value chain yeah, where you say, okay, this is core expertise of this company, this mm. company, this company. And even the risk to drill at the wrong position, you're sharing with others. Yeah. And if you hit the right uh, point in the ocean, the benefits, yeah. everyone wins. Or think about the movie industry, where not every movie is a success. Only one out of 100 movies is a real success. Yeah. And only one out of 500 is a true blockbuster. So no one to today drink. goes and makes a movie alone. Yeah. Yeah? But it allows you to try it much, much more often. Mm. And with this, a whole collection of companies who are in this movie world together is winning time and gaining time to, to come to success here. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, that's, that's it. The, um, I'm curious about one thing. I like talking with you also because you have really a big picture view of the industry and like you can, which is, which is great. And I think great for, for the audience. This, but, <laughs> but after 25 years of being in this industry, I think it's about time to understand a little. <laughs> yeah, you, you understand, but you have a clarity to explain mm. it and you not only, I mean, you look really at the bigger picture, maybe also from your background, we'll talk about it from being more from a business background and a pure science. I don't know. It's, you have the, this, this bigger view, which I like. Uh, you, one thing uh, that I saw recently was from the number of drugs developed by who developed the drug and then who launched it. Uh, I don't remember. I think it was a McKinsey study, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. I mean, it's been 10 years that you always hear, okay, all the bio biotech is a powerhouse and most of the drugs come from biotech companies and then all are licensed to pharma. Mm -hmm. But I think in 2022, I was super surprised. I think was somewhere close to half of the product launches were made by biotech, like larger biotech organizations, which means it's not only the development now, it's also more like the, the commercial launch. Um, can you like comment on this? Or do you, do you see this also as a, as a EvoTech working more with actually mm. biotech organization or larger biotech firms versus only big pharma? Like, how do you see that that point of the industry? I mean, this trend back to fully integ integrated companies launching drugs is, of course, a function of um, orphan diseases mm. yeah, to start with. And it's also a function of people who have done something and, see and seen something very successfully happening in large pharma or in mid-sized pharma companies, and then repeating this in but, yeah. in biotech companies, because with VCs a, putting them, <laughs> which which makes a lot of yeah. sense. And if you look at the success of Alexion, or if you look at the success of Argenix, or if you look at the success of many of the companies who basically were very clear in their vision, mm. what does it take along the value chain, and what do we have to build, and what don't we have to build? Mm. For example, if you are making a drug, making your own manufacturing is a very, very important question to answer because building GMP systems in manufacturing different. is a high hurdle to mm. jump over. Uh, and that's why many of these companies said, no, we'd rather go to do the clinical, regulatory, and then sales steps first, then creating a manufacturing infrastructure or creating a discovery infrastructure mm. yeah, is also something where you say, why not doing this? So that's why where EvoTech is going is totally clear. We will create a multi-modality. We sometimes named it Autobahn to cures, which is a <laughs> data-driven yeah, multi-modality platform where we can offer everything when it comes to optimizing a drug target to bring this into clinical situations mm -hmm. and then manufacturing also this either small molecule or biologic mm -hmm. or cell therapy into the future. Where EvoTech will not go, we will not go into running clinical trials on our own. That will be the exception also in the future. And we will definitely not go is into selling our own drugs mm -hmm. uh, to go commercial. And there's a very clear reason, which is not limited by that we wouldn't know how to do this, but it would change the culture of the company mm -hmm. dramatically if you all of a sudden have a regulatory sales environment and a marketing environment from product launches yeah, on, on top of the culture that we want to create. Because we are creating here a science-driven culture mm. where... The, the 5,000 people that we have are roughly 4,000 scientists and 1,000 people doing other things in, in SGNA functions or supporting functions. But we have more than 35% of PhDs in the company. This is the highest density of PhDs in any um, uh, biotech environment that I know. And I think that's going to be our key strength also into the future to keep the science power Mm. and run the platform with the science power and then really go for our co-owning model with our partners 
who then have the strengths in commercialization, who then have that. Having said that, of course, there's a paradigm which I completely understand. If you are one of these biotech companies who has a drug in their hands, which has a, a targeted market, yeah, then it is today easier than ever before to also go all the way through mm. the market. And that's why this paradigm will come back and we'll see it more often. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically what the study also shows. And I guess Cross was like having more experience, the pharma executives running some of the biotechs. It's also more, I mean, easier to go into commercials. I have some experience. Must be smart people at McKinsey. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes. Um, but, no, it's a bit, it's interesting, but maybe you can reflect also what you've seen in Europe. I mean, you know, you have, you have quite some, I mean, a few biotechs in Europe who have made it to commercial. And usually, I mean, it's also a huge value infection point and also in terms of exits. Sometimes you must, I mean, quite often. I mean, Argenix is yeah. a great example. I, mean, I don't know where the market cap is now, but I think north of 10 billion, so very, uh, pretty, I mean, amazing. Uh, same with like Telion, same with the Genmab. I mean, can you reflect a bit, maybe more like uh, you yourself, how you've used the industry, let's say, on the, on the last few years, especially as the European industry? Like, yeah, bouncing on what I just said, what, like what? I mean, first of all, all these companies that you mentioned don't have anything in them, which is purely European or, or purely driven by Europe. And that's, mm. I think, always my starting point. If you look at the successful companies, they have a global scientific lead with a global mindset to win global markets. Mm. And if you look at Jan van der Winkel and what he has made out of GenMap, there is a Danish company that is a global leader. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Argenix, that's a, a, a Belgian company that is a global leader. And yeah. that's how it should be because mm -hmm. there's only one disease and that's globally the same. And that's why our industry is the worst advised uh, industry if you go to anything that is national driven or whatever. <laughs> what makes sense is you have to have scientific hubs and biotech hubs yeah. where more energy is coming together than in places where people don't understand the dynamic of this industry. Yeah. And that's why I, I think there's a... Um, a function that we are experiencing now where Boston, San Diego, um, San Francisco uh, had really this, this huge advantage about 10 to 15 years ago mm. that a biotech hub was happening there. Mm -hmm. And that's why collective learning was faster happening than in remote places in Europe. Like yeah? I'm kidding. <laughs> Hamburg used I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, Ham it, it's, a, it's a fair comment. Yeah. Has, has less proportion, the, has less biotech. It, it's an absolutely fair comment, and that's why for us, networking Hamburg into the world of drug discovery was an absolute must from the mm. very beginning, and that's also what we have done from the very beginning. And that's why, for example, at our site in Hamburg, you will hear everyone talking English to you. Even the yeah. signs in the street, everything, everything is in English. Everything at Evotech yes. is built for a global company that people can come to Hamburg and feel at home and integrated. Mm -hmm. yeah, because otherwise, there is no Hamburg-based drug that you can sell only in no. Hamburg <laughs> that will ever make it to the market. I think that's clear to you. Mm -hmm. But And that's why I, I typically don't like it to reflect on Europe because... You have to be competitive on a global industry, yeah. yeah. But maybe not the like success or like yeah. I mean I, I like your answer and I mean I share it completely mm -hmm. and even when I was running La Biotech mm -hmm. where we're you know a European slash global from day one and very like always speaking English. Like and this is I think fundamental, but I don't think that many I mean not, not everyone in biotech in Europe is, is doing this, which is a bit a bit surprising as well, but I think the, the best ones are doing it, and it seems like pretty shared among the best. Either the even small biotechs, big phones, any, anyone is doing. But yeah, but it's like a one-on-one -on -one recipe for everyone who starts. Yeah, mm. And I don't say this because I, I want to be here. We know it better than others, but it, it limits you immediately in your growth. For example, if your company culture is French only. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
and our people in in France didn't like this at the beginning, but now they understand imagine. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now they totally understand it, and they they understand that if we want to be competitive, then we have to be open minded. And you will see if you go to Evotech in in France, it is amazingly international. Even in Toulouse, which is not the most international French city, it's an amazing city, by the way. Yeah. Mm. I guess it. I mean, there, I, I just looked up mm. coming to Hamburg that you had the, the Airbus site really close by. So I guess the Airbus site also in Toulouse. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a connection of sites. Yeah. That, uh, you can share the planes. The, the no, we don't, <laughs> because we are data driven. They <laughs> they right. they take planes. <laughs> anyway, no, that's uh, mm. but uh, no sound. I mean, it's fair. Uh, but I, I was more thinking for for Europe on how you. Well, I mean, more quickly, not not we really looking at the success or what what's the success factors or how's the company from inside, but more seeing the ecosystem. I'm very positive. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have seen the worst funding environment in the last two to three years um, in the US, but also in Europe. And nevertheless, many very, very good funds have come together in Europe now. And if you look at the talent pool of the, the top VC groups in Europe, this is amazingly cool people. And on top of that, you had a cash inflow from private equity funds who understand that biotech and healthcare will be their future key playground and they haven't been here so far. Mm. So I think there is really a flow of capital waiting to find the industry opportunities that they need to see. And here I think Europe is is open for that because The classical VC sources are not operating. Um, And and that's why I'm actually here from all the science and the science projects that we see, matching this with with the uh, flow of capital and also the the newly raised funds Mm. of VCs. It could be a very, very good next 10 years coming. Mm. I had a question on the on the private equity part of because I mean you had I mean we talked with with Antoine from Sophie Nova with some some money from from private equity, but still only and, and opened the capital to private equity, but didn't like sell the fund versus some funds where we saw say LSP let's say, mm. uh, 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 not, um, LSP became part of EQT. EQT. Yeah, and you have Abingworth. Abingworth yeah, Carlyle, I think. Uh, Carlyle. Carlyle. Mm. Um, so, like, and then as I had a discussion with one, a lot of private equity were also investing in healthcare, but, but more general, like hospitals. And, and I know that a lot of CROs also own slash run by... by by private equity in that but on that side I heard not necessarily that positive and I hear that it's mm. it's like basically printing cash and doing that so what's I mean I guess private equity in general I mean there is for sure a huge mm. influx of capital but there can be some flip sides like do you see that? Do you like I concerned about I think this? it is um, no, first, I'm not concerned when anyone understands that investing in healthcare is, in general, the best sectors that you can deploy money with. Mm. Because there's a, a real need that can be solved. And value. if it is mm. solved, it creates value. Mm. Yeah. So that's why I'm always surprised that many people still have not realized how big the overall opportunity in healthcare is. Yeah? Yeah. Much easier in our industry, I think, to create value than in the fashion industry, where you are competing brand versus brand and where you're competing season versus season and where you have volatilities. Especially from a human, like even society value versus That's even a different topic, (laughs) yeah, but but, I also don't want to go there. But (laughs) I think that that's clear. And what is also clear is if you look at healthcare, that so far all these funds have only been able to dig deeper into business models that had a top line and that had a bottom line. Yeah. yeah. 
Of course, if you go to true innovation business models, a top line and a bottom line in that format that don't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So that's why I think you see here an evolution that private equity started to understand the CRO industry faster and better because there was a top, top line and bottom line. But the underlying science yeah, will automatically bring them earlier and earlier in the value chains. And that's mm. why you now see these moves of the private equity funds into the venture funds mm. as a hedge to not only take one company, but take portfolios of companies. Mm. And that's, I think, a great starting point. And many people expected that this will turn on the pipe of money within a quarter or two. No, it will take a one to two years, but then it will be a constant flow mm -hmm. because that always happened when private equity entered a new industry. Yeah, I guess they enter for like then, seven to but, ten years. But it, now takes, but now it takes two to three years for them to fully understand these industries and then to fully understand the dynamic of these industries, and then you will see there's a new flow of capital coming in, which will be very good for many. That's interesting. The flow of capital that unfortunately has stopped at this stage is public money. Yeah. yeah? And that's why I think it, it will take both for a full recovery of biotech. It will take the flow of private capital, and it will take the flow of, of public money as well. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. I like your yeah. interesting view. Uh, very, yeah. I'm always a bit reserved, but I don't know. It's my you know, a bit personal feeling with private equity. Maybe. And, uh, but yeah, it's uh, let's see. I mean, for, for so far, at least bringing capital and and still the, the VC. I mean, I guess if if it's like making return, but not like outside outsized returns. Yeah, but I think also That's here, if you look at the business model of venture capitalists over the last two decades, you have to to really look behind the curtain. Not every VC fund was, was outsizingly successful. Yeah, yeah. Many of the VC funds didn't raise a second fund because they just lousy returns. Yeah, mm -hmm. So don't be fooled by the Prada, Gucci's and Amani's. Yeah of also the VC industry who had very good successes. Mm. But then the first have to repeat the successes from fund to fund. Yeah. Yeah. And secondly, yeah, you should not uh, underestimate how hard it is also for VCs to make a sustainable business model. Out of yeah. that. And th that's I again for why... I think the VCs, yeah. I, I am not too worried. I, I guess more from like, um, it's more like, seen so many like bad examples of private equity funds who you know buy a company and then five seven years and just half liquidated or half like dilute and extract a lot of value no but that's but also here i think no one yeah if you go to the roman catholic church you should not be surprised <laughs> yeah if someone says amen in that church so the rules are clear yeah yeah so if you're talking to private equity the rules are clear, and if you are not certain about what the rules are, then you should stop that dialogue. Mm. But that private equity is there to make money with investments and smart guidance of companies. That's their business model. Okay. And that these are business models that have time limits. That's their business model. So I think no one should be naive here, and that's also not what I'm sensing yeah. mm. that that people are naive on this one. Mm. That's right. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, no, that's no, that's um, that's good. And enough on this topic. Maybe we can switch uh, more to to you yourself. Um, you, I, we mentioned it briefly that you're a very good like overview and understand the business landscape. But is I mean when when we discussed you you. You don't have a bio slash biology or biotech like diploma background. I mean, you come from psychology with business. Um, mm. How like did that? And and when I talk to you, I mm. feel like there is a lot of like there is a you are talking differently than someone who has who has necessarily a biotech background or, or like. You understand very well and, and good enough, mm -hmm. but it gives you also this like bigger picture and also psychology. 
I can sense or I can feel some some things there. Like, can you walk us a bit through of like how how was it to get into the industry and to like get this like expertise? until now how it helps you or how you deal with it how you deal like currently to not necessarily have this like super deep biotech mm -hmm. bone even though i think you probably acquired it but can you walk a bit through that i mean it's pretty rare in the industry to not have really a scientific background so so i'm in this industry for 25 years yeah. and i now can really say that i fell in love with this industry 25 mm -hmm. years ago because Uh, before that, I was a consultant in many different industries, which already gave me the advantage that I have seen the pulp and paper industry. I've seen the railway industry. I've mm. seen, as a consultant, I have to 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 say, the top I've of the seen, aspect of it. I've seen industry. the insurance industry and I've seen the banking industry, and they are all wonderful industries. But if you can see the magic of what, for example, an antigen and an adjuvant do in making vaccines happen, and if you can be part of that, then all of a sudden all other industries, to me, were no longer so attractive. attractive. Mm. Then I entered this industry, which is, I think, also important, via my core competence, because I'm a finance guy. Yeah. So when you're a CFO at I Intercell. I was a CFO of, of Intercell, and... That's also then, I think, quite interesting. You can then have a, a different path as a CFO that you get totally fixated on the core business mm. substance or you try to understand the dynamic of your numbers. Mm. Yeah, And that's the beauty of our industry. The dynamic of our numbers is driven by science and it's not driven by interest rates. Mm. science is a so much more powerful tool than interest rates. Mm. Yeah? And that's why I really understood probably relatively fast as a CFO that if I don't believe in the science that we are making, we will never be a successful company. Mm. Yeah? And that's why I started to simply talk to the people who do the science. And, and that's the beauty of, of my life that I just get excited when I hear a scientist talking about his latest experiment, knowing that not all of them will work. But you can see why people are doing this because most of the people in this industry are truly motivated mm. by finding a drug, mm. finding a solution. And yes, it's not always that esoteric that you are only thinking about the drug out there, but you also have Or to just do doing amazing yeah, science as well. Exactly, mm. yeah. But you also have to do uh, sometimes a, a very tactical job, but it nevertheless feels so much better in this industry than what other people can do. And that's why it's a privilege to be in this industry. And so over 10 years, you kind of got yourself into an understanding, I guess, was vaccines, intercell, the vaccine science. Mm. And then how did it help you, the, the jump to, let's say, CEO, where you were managing much more than the finance, like kind of the whole company? How does it help you today? Like At the end, you have to find a business model that you feel comfortable with, that you are representing. Mm. Yeah, And at Evotech, we, we are representing a high science-driven R&D model that is linked to a partnering model that ultimately will result in a large royalty pool. Mm. And I think in 2009, when we started or restarted Evotech in a way, that was for me very clear that that's the way I want to go. But it was also very clear to me that this is the long run. Mm. yeah, Because there is no royalty pool in happening <laughs> in three years. And there is no royalty pool happening without uh, volatility along the way. And there's no royalty pool happening if you don't fail. Mm. But what was very clear to me is that it will only work if we are creating a a sizable portfolio of options mm. yeah, to really leverage against the risk that many of these things are just yeah. not scaled enough. Yeah? And, and I think that's all it took to, to make this transition, transition. And now it's about having an organization that, that is efficient together with partners finding mm. drugs. 
So, uh, we'll go back. I mean, I think we'll continue on EvoTech as an organization, mm -hmm. but on, on you yourself, it sounds like it was the right fit for you as in like being pretty like mm -hmm. very knowledgeable on the business side of like, okay, sharing the royalties, making partnerships, uh, link this while still having a science foundation versus maybe developing the next mRNA therapy and being the CEO of that kind of company? I would not exclude that, <laughs> but it's also maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something where um, that you are exactly there at the time of a drug where it shows that it's not only a good experiment, but it will be a product mm. that sells. That's a very, very rare moment. Yeah. yeah, And that's why, for example, it's very rare, first, that products go to the market, second, that it's a company yeah. that brings that drug to the market, which has done this from the beginning to the end, yeah. and thirdly, that the company who does this makes this in a repetitive fashion. Yeah, And, and that's where, for me, it was very clear um, that it needs scale in, in a business model to have these opportunity spaces open and that's that's why again I'm I'm open for many things but what we are doing at EvoTech is just a very very good business model yeah mm. yeah I'm, I'm still sorry I'm still block, trying to stay on the like maybe not just your background but where you are staying today of like your your skills just still trying to get a picture of yourself of your skills um I can make good PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> with AI. <laughs> no, but still with this... Because, I mean, for example, I feel like you... You have... I mean... Hard, I mean to, trying to... Yeah, to understand where, where you, your skills are, or like where, where your personality and skills uh, and how, how it connects to your background. But maybe it's not necessarily just to your background. It's maybe how, how you as a person... Um, but how... Like, how do you f see yourself, let's say, from a skill set, personality to do that role as CEO compared? Yeah. The, the biggest ability here is that you have to be able to surround yourself with people who are better than you are. Yeah. And I think that's, for me, so humbling every day that I know that I'm one of a team and I have so many people in the company who are in many, many areas so much better than I am, but I can trust them. Yeah. Yeah? And for example, I, I really have the tendency to work very long with the people who want to work with me because that's, I think, uh, an ability that I, I really value a lot, that I can trust I mean, long, people. Long term. Long term, yeah. yeah. I, my CSO and I, Kurt Dorman, we are working together now for 11 years. Mm. Our, our COO and I, we're working for a decade. To, so there's, there's just, because that's where you then become all of a sudden as a team efficient, having said that, it always is important that teams don't become complacent. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So having here this dynamic that you still have a good fight, a balance, yeah, yeah. that you still have a good fight and not everything is, is happening at the lowest compromise, that's important to make an organization grow and to yeah. push an organization forward. And at the end, you always have to question yourself, are you still the right leader for a company for the next phase of a company? Yeah. Are you? I'm, <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. And so you, uh, maybe how you how did you, this question, I mean, I think, I mean, it's a very hard mm -hmm. question, a very challenging question, mm -hmm. but how how did, did you answer that question? I mean, when you got in, I guess you had, Already a very long term vision, but I guess you had some milestone of say whatever three to five years maybe, and then you we like iterated. I mean now it's been five fifteen years. How did you go? Like was there some big milestones, some cycles? Like there was very big milestone at the beginning where the idea of discovery can be a profitable business mm. did not exist in two thousand and nine. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah? Because discovery up to that point was a cost center yeah. and was a loss-making part of the industry, which was highly disregarded. So that was really a first milestone to say, okay, can we make a business model happening where discovery, highest science, is appreciated as a profitable business? Mm -hmm. And 
that was important for for us. And from there on, we really wanted to explore, especially platform worlds, mm. where where we are leading the field by not only going after one target or one idea, but really building a platform. So and I say IPS, this, IPS where, and I start with omics-driven drug discovery and drug development, yeah. where Evotech today is building the most comprehensive, systematic and unbiased world to understand proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, and translates this via disease models, but also starting with molecular patient databases in more efficient processes than I think anyone else in the world. Yeah. But we built a company that is that is fundamentally believing in omics. Yeah. Yeah? And why do I say this with, with all this emotion in my voice? Sorry about that. <laughs> because it was a very radical decision in 2015 14, to say, okay, we believe that omics will be the future where the computing power was, was not, not, there, not there, where the data was not there, but where it was clear that we will understand biology down to its single cell one day. Yeah? And that's where we were coming from, and that's what we built as Panomics as a platform. The second platform that we built was really a full belief in a switch away from not very telling animal models to iPSC, so induced pluripotent mm -hmm. stem cell driven drug discovery mm -hmm. and iPSC driven off the shelf cell therapies. Mm -hmm. That was a decision that we made in 2012, shortly after Yamanaka got his Nobel Prize, yeah. to say, okay, we're gonna go down really. that path because if this is true, then many diseases will not end with symptomatic treatments anymore, but they will be able to be cured. Mm -hmm. And that was the paradigm shift. Yeah? And the third uh, uh, platform that we have really a lot of confidence in is to build a completely new access world for biologics. And what do I mean with this? With what we're doing in Just Evotech Biologics will allow us to make antibodies not, antibodies not only more manufacturable and more efficiently usable, but also it will allow us to make cost of goods for antibodies happening that will be first allow many disease areas also to be treated with yeah. biologics, which today is not the case, and secondly, which will allow us to make drugs at significantly different costs and price points in the yeah. future, and with this you give wider access to biologics and that would be just an amazing contribution of Evotech, not only for the company, but also for the world. Yeah, so if I understand well, for you yourself, yeah. there was a lot of mice that were tied to the company of like, will we achieve this? Will that decision bring fruits? And then this brought back to you yourself of like, okay, do I want to continue or not? Um, no, for me it was always, is there still enough vision in myself yeah. to go to work every day in the morning and see where we are going? And you wouldn't believe it, but we are just at the beginning. Mm. Yeah. Because there is a market environment of $140 billion spent every year in research and development. Evotech does not even have a billion in sales at this stage. Yeah. But we are owning some of the core technology platforms that yeah. that we can bring forward in the future. And this, together with our partners, will be very powerful. Mm. I still want to stick a bit more with you than, <laughs> than you would take. But I mean, I, I feel it very... feel it amazing. I mean, I was meeting another CEO, and, and he had very... I mean, he was very rapidly always going to the team and to the organization, and not necessarily talking, like, even not that comfortable talking about himself, which I find very, also a very good sign, actually, as a, as a leader to, to, to see much past ourselves and very little ego, or how, how you want to define ego. But still, I want to understand a bit, like, what's, what's, what's behind you. Maybe that can be one point, like, you, I feel like you're very, I even said it in the intro, very accessible, friendly, 
humble as a, as a person. But it's, it's a compliment, but uh, I, I really feel, I feel, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, like, if you are like, if it's just who you are, or if there's like, you are like trying to maintain that, or you like, is there something around there or something you can share around this notion of like, because I, I think it's, a, yeah, it's something pretty unique with, with, with yourself and yeah, can you? <laughs> yeah, so first of all, thanks for saying that and for obviously um, feeling it that way. Mm. And secondly, I just don't see any fun in pretending anything that that is not authentic yeah. to me. Why should I do this? Yeah. And <laughs> and and it's first it would be completely inefficient. Secondly, it's not what I wanna do. And and thirdly, I always hope that everyone who I'm friendly or clear to is also friendly and clear to me. Yeah. And I say this because I make decisions. Yeah a lot and many of them are unpleasant for yeah. an R&D project and, and, and but what I'm hopefully doing is not making decisions without rational mm. and not making decisions on a on a too personal basis mm -hmm. yeah and of course we all have our personal biases but but I try to be analytical to the decision And then people can take decisions and then they perceive them as not totally unfair. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, as you just mentioned it before, when you're in crisis mode, you have to have a different speed of decision. Mm -hmm. yeah? And people will then only trust you that you're doing the right thing if they have experienced you right. doing the right thing also in the past. So that's a bit where I'm coming from. And that's also, I hope, at least how I behave not only in the company, but also outside of the company. Mm. I don't wear different clothes outside of the company or inside of the company. I don't talk differently. I don't, you know, for me, it's maybe it's too close because I don't have this differentiation of private and business mm. as much as probably I should have it. But but that's why I, I'm quite balanced also on, on that front, that there's not a second... A second Werner somewhere. Yeah. There's no avatar. <laughs> <laughs> But is that something... I'm still curious, like, how much is that something that you had, like, inside of yourself or is something you cultivated or is there something you tried to work on or is it just, like, kind of very natural? Listen to you, your own... The, the I probably also, when I think back, when I was 25, I had this idea of I want to have a... Uh, a big career and big career was then associated I want to have a big car mm. <laughs> now that's the worst dream I can have in my life yeah <laughs> to just what why do you do it yeah. yeah what's the what's the prize at the end yeah and that prize at the end has for me totally changed mm. yeah that now it's for me to say okay I want to build a company that has true relevance mm. yeah, in this industry to our partners and to patients. And if I'm the one who can drive this and if I'm the one who can do this mean. together with our team here, then it's it's a privilege mm. to, to get the buy-in from others to do this together with you and you even get paid for that privilege. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's right. and the why. Yeah, you sound like you're very clear, clear wise. But still, I'm still curious on the like, on how like, how you yeah, how you cultivate or not cultivate or where it comes from or how is it like? It's a so much easier mind map to create for yourself if you are running a portfolio of 10 neuro projects. Yeah? And we do this together with BMS, uh, where you can see, okay, this could be the next generation of neuro projects that really make a difference in a world where there's no cure mm. yeah? and not even a treatment. Yeah? 
And if you understand that this is the core business that it's all centered around, then the rest becomes significantly less important because yeah. that's then the core. And that's yeah. where, then that's what drives me. That I say, okay, do I see the core of what we are doing or don't I see the core? And the core is not that you have a fancy dinner at mm. some place, which I also like, by the way. <laughs> but but that's not the core of, this, the, goal, yeah. of, of the, the industry and it's definitely not the core, uh, the goal of the company. And that's why coming, as you want to have it personal, as long as I feel this when I go to work, that the core is exciting, mm. then it's not, then I don't need a motivational trainer or a psychologist or anyone, then science is motivating in itself. Mm. That's amazing. That's the, yeah. That's amazing. I, I'm, I'm, in front of that I hear still, I mean, it's, it seems very obvious to you and very deeply integrated. And I mean, probably also as experience, there is some, it, it brings it as well. I mean, even... What I'm you an said. old man. I do this for 25 years. And of course, there is a, a different tone to this yeah. than 20 years ago. And I made more mistakes than many other people uh, in my life. But at least I tried to not to repeat them too often. And I tried to learn from them. Uh -uh. Yeah? And if you keep this ability, then then you can always test drive yourself and say, okay, am I still doing the right thing? And mm. that's for me not a question. Yeah, it's, it still sounds like it's, yeah. I mean, even me personally, I, I reflect on this and it's, I think like, I don't tend to be very humble. Or like it's something that I don't, um, don't tend to be super humble already in the past you 10 years. You speak Chinese. <laughs> you should be proud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can be proud, but I'm not necessarily super humble about it. Or like, mm. And when you, or if, yeah, anyway, it's, if something is important, how do you, can you like, you know, mi like not mimic it, but like make it more important or work on it or change some aspect of your personality. It's, it's something that maybe I'm also What clearly on. does not work. Yeah, you cannot do something which has a long time horizon and not be authentic about it yeah, yeah. because then it kills you. Mm. If it would, for me, be hard work to believe in what we are doing every day, yeah, it kills you. Mm. If, for me, it would be hard work to conv to be convinced about the company and try to get go to an investor, it would kill me. Yeah. Mm. At this stage, it's not. Even, I, I perceive it as a as a privileged dialogue. Because there's no, there is no hardship. Yeah, there is no pain. There is, it's, and I think that's that's a bit where, if you want to go into advice mode here, that's a bit where I would advise anyone to go. Yeah, mm. to say, okay, you have to really believe it. Otherwise, it's otherwise mm. it's too hard. Yeah. So yeah, believe it, and it sounds like a lot of the things you do, basically daily, just fits really well with your whatever system, whatever value, whatever your core. And whatever challenge fits, that comes. It fits yeah, really be well. Right? Because there are, in our world, there is a challenge coming every week or every day or mm. every month where you say, now I'm really fed up. Yeah. But if what you're doing is is giving you this light at the end of the tunnel or this, this picture beyond that, then it's so easy to motivate yourself. And then you say, okay, There is a drug that failed, but that should not stop. 199 others waiting. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I guess and it's that's also why we also, and I, I, I really, I'm kind of proud f uh, about this. I have to say, in 2009, I wrote our, our slogan: "Mission never, st uh, research never stops." Yeah. And, and that was, and it's still, it's still, that, it's yeah. the, still the same. Tagline I would write today. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. That was already a great fit, uh, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. The what maybe the maybe one thing on a bit personal as well. Maybe what's from a like day to day. What's your, like a typical day in the, in Vienna, Vienna shoes? Or what's your <laughs> typical uh, day? Vienna gets up 
at, at about six o'clock in the morning. Do some push-ups. Yeah. He doesn't do push-ups, <laughs> but, but but you do. Yeah. Sometimes he managed to run, mm. yeah, uh, which I like a lot. And then I tried to do emails at home. Then I go into the office where I have the idea cultivated that I try to be as much as possible outside of the office. Mm. And that doesn't mean that I'm not working, but my work is better done when I'm with partners, um, at conferences, when I am uh, with investors, when I am on site mm. of one of the 17 sites uh, that Evotech has. So that's why... Uh, I'm rarely in my How Hamburg based <laughs> office, uh, which makes me nevertheless be fully connected. And that's maybe another thing. We created a virtual management team structure way before COVID in 2015 already, which makes us also as a team be quite efficient that we can work together despite the fact that we're not on the same places uh, all the time. And then I typically work more than eight hours a day mm. uh, and most of the times end somewhere north of 12 to 14 hours a day mm. yeah but i never count and <laughs> would not know who to tell yeah. what i'm counting yeah. that's me. and you sound pretty in your day also pretty balanced or that is it not like you sound pretty we let's say relaxed about it or like very not not relaxed but balanced i think if you don't have stress you don't live yeah, yeah. if you're not excited about certain things then yeah. they are not an, an, a good enough challenge but it doesn't overpower you there are moments so, yeah. when you are afraid hmm. there are moments when you're excited and that's again uh reflecting about it if you are not excited anymore if you are not feeling kind of lumpen fever anymore when you go uh, i don't know to a discussion meeting or to a negotiation then you probably shouldn't do it anymore because yeah. then you don't have the the, the the stamina to do it anymore yeah. and 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 the energy to do it that's interesting uh, yeah it's, um, it rings a, a lot oh. of things uh, in my mind uh but uh no, that sounds sounds very good um from um you want to maybe i mean we can start to, to wrap up. Um, we, we touched, I mean, on EvoTech, just from, from a wrapping up, but we, you touched mm. quite a lot of things on the different platforms you're building. I walked around the building just there, but the new IPSC building uh, coming. I mean... Yeah, that's a good example of something where when you take the risk... 10 years ago, it's crazy. When you take the risk of building a new building... Yeah. Where, this, where it takes three years to really have from scratch a building done, how many things do we know that will happen in three years from now and what the experimental cascades will look like in three years from now? Yeah? So and that's the world. <laughs> and the world <laughs> looks like... Yeah, yeah, but again, that's why making these long-term CapEx-driven decisions is mm. something where I'm totally... Um, alert uh, mm. about them. For example, we are at this stage investing into just Evotech Biologics, our JPOD infrastructure for lowering costs for biologics, $500 million. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. And, and that's a lot of money where the underlying hypothesis that this will create value and this will be highly profitable, that's a big, big, big mm. decision. Yeah, That's a really big decision. I guess no, yeah. like not really miles. I mean, the go no go is like really. I mean, building a building is a really like no, building three, a building five is years. easy. Many, yeah, many, yeah, but, but but creating a an authentic business plan that utilizes yeah. such an infrastructure. Yeah, that's that's where I get really excited and say, okay, do we do this now or not? And again, creating five hundred million dollars for novel biologics as an infrastructure and creating six hundred jobs just for that. Mm. Is is also the responsibility not only to your shareholders who give you that money to do this, mm. but also to 
to the people who you say this is going to be mm. your future. It better be be right. And not everything will work out, I'm also sure. But on just the politics, I'm sure that it will work out. Yeah. <laughs> you sound pretty confident. Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, I mean, also no, what, I, what I mean is that it's not like, a, let's say, in a, in a more let's say AI or software where you every six months you can reevaluate and you can pivot. I mean, here it's like a yeah, it's really big commitment and a very long term commitment. And you until you see if it works or not, it's like much yeah, more longer term. That, and that also that's comes down to the business model. If you are Sanofi or BMS or whoever, you want to work with a partner who is just as long in the game mm. and committed to the game as you are. Because otherwise, no one would be well advised to work with us if they have the feeling tomorrow they will go away or mm. tomorrow they will just exit or tomorrow they will switch from uh, well, this modality to that modality. So this is also building the trust to our partners. And this is also the reason why once partners work with us, they have a very, very high retention rate to come mm. back to us. And they are also happy to to acknowledge that yeah, mm. by paying prices that are probably sometimes uh, a, 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 a bit premium compared to others. But then they... Our, our people understand and our partners understand what opportunity costs are. I think mm. that's the easy phrase for that. Mm. Sounds like, yeah, it's a good good, good way to, 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 to wrap up on. Like, I mean, it sounds like I, I like this very long-term vision and, I mean, crazy also how it worked from you know, IPS in 2012 until now. It's crazy how, how a lot of long-term bets worked and how you yourself also think very long term and how you yourself think also very long term from a does it fit to yourself like can you like well or like you want to add something there on the on the on the long term thinking or how you cultivate it how you like i mean ipsc is is a very good example for that yeah. because i of course did not understand everything that was behind ipscs but i completely understood for the last years already that we as an industry are are just not evolving if we are basing our decisions on animal models that are completely dislinked very often from the diseases that we want to solve. Yeah, yeah. And if there is a model system out there which is directly from the human modeling to the human, then this is a clear evolutionary step to, to make. And I was actually totally surprised that not many more people have done it. Now I am not surprised because it is hard mm -hmm. to do this. It's hard. It takes time. You fail a lot. But if you're getting there, then you are leading this, this, this platform. And that's why you have to, to reduce this to the simple question, do you trust an animal model more than a human model mm -hmm. yeah, if this is giving you education for a drug discovery process? And that's a clear answer. Mm. that's a good um, yeah I like that also the, the shift from animal to human based mm. research and it will come more and more with wrapping up on like what do you want? AI ML enabled research I mean a lot of exciting times exciting times and maybe as a, as a finish if people want to follow you or learn more about you or yourself or Evotech what's the best way to on Evotech, we are very prominent on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And if you want to write me, I have a temporary email address, which is werner.lanthaler at evotech.eu. But my permanent email address is werner.lanthaler at evotech.com. And I, I don't... I don't have an Instagram account or something <laughs> like that, I think. Yeah. You share on LinkedIn, maybe? I, I do so LinkedIn, LinkedIn, but I don't have a f thing where people can follow me. To, yeah. I only like others okay. on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And um, no, that's that's great. And actually, I, I haven't seen many, or I haven't seen any podcasts or where you were we call it any podcasts. So I no, think it's so one it's of the first premiere, time. so I hope that's I amazing. did well. And uh, yeah. we can do that again soon. Pleasure. Thanks, Anna. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Me again. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thanks a lot for listening to the end. If you're keen, 
please hit the follow button somewhere maybe or the like review share button share it with some connections it would help us a lot especially this early in the show uh, and before telling you more what's behind the show i want to say a big kudos and and thanks to the team Kieran, web development, uh, Catherine in marketing, Mary in logistics, Wayne in editing. They did an amazing job and there's a lot of hard work I uh, put into, into, into the show. So now what's behind? So Floodbio uh, as a company was founded in March 2022. I'm one of the founder and previously I founded Labiotech.eu. And we started the company building a, a marketplace for the biotech industry but we didn't have enough product market fit. So we decided to pivot to a content business uh, with the first product being, being that podcast. We don't want to create you know, yet another podcast. There's already a lot of them around, uh, but we believe Europe needs a high quality, long form uh, podcast to help both professionals and biotech enthusiasts be better informed, grow and just be better at what uh, what they're doing uh, and so that's uh, why we are uh, creating the podcast we are selecting the best europeans in biotech we can uh, find and uh, we are interviewing mostly actually offline so we can have really the highest quality both technical aspect but most importantly on the dance and the content and the flow of the of the, of the content we release one episode, around one episode per month on all the major platforms. Money-wise, we are financed by our own private investments uh, and our business model is based on advertisement. So it's the sponsored messages, slots that you see in, in each episode. Um, and we are sponsored by financial support from individuals and corporates. So anyway, I will not make it longer. Uh, if you are, I hope you share our vision and if you're keen to hear more or you want to reach out or you want to share some feedback, please uh, send, shoot us an email, hi at flood.bio. Again, thanks for listening and see you in the next episode. Bye.